Well, praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. It's so good to be here with you tonight. Uh, we're at our second of three classes tonight. We're talking about how to handle or uh, deal with difficult people without becoming one. My name is Pastor Caleb Brown. I'm the assistant pastor here at Charlotte Baptist Church, where the Reverend Dr. James A. Douglas is the senior pastor. We appreciate you so much for being with us uh, live uh, for our Bible studies and how you have been supporting us. And we just appreciate you as you showed up at our inspirational moments. You're showing up on YouTube. You're showing up on our Sunday morning worship. We just appreciate you. And so tonight, I'm going to ask you to continue to help us out. If there's something that you hear that you like, hit that like button. Share uh, all our programs with someone. If you believe that it's helping you, we are here to help someone else. Amen. So we're going to spread the gospel. We're going to spread this word as far and wide as we can. So God bless you. Tonight I'm excited. We are, like I said, this is the second installment about how to deal with difficult people without becoming one. I hope you catch the real direction. We're really talking about not so much the people we're dealing with, but we don't become the people that they are. That we are distinct in our behavior. Because you see, the world is in such disarray. We need people who are standing up and be Christians today, saints today, holy and distinct today. So we're going to pray and we're going to go and, and go right into our lesson tonight. Amen? So let's pray. Father God in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity. We give you all the glory and the praise. Lord, I realize that it's not me, but it's you. So Holy Spirit, come and take over. I submit, I surrender. I ask you to forgive me anything I said or done that's not right in your sight. Holy Spirit, take over. Take over. Speak to everyone that's in their homes, whether they are at the job or maybe riding in their car, wherever they are. Speak to their hearts, Lord, and help us, Lord, to all be what you call us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Now, all right, so last week we started with defining who can be considered a difficult person. We talked about people who be antagonistic, people who are obstacles. They're, they're the optimist. Uh, op, I'm sorry, I'm all messed up right now. Uh, pray for me. Uh, but they want to. They want to. They want to be uh, people who are all in your way, trying to prevent you from moving forward. There are people who try to keep you from having all the things God will have for you. There are folk who come into your life and want to try to stop you, prevent you from moving forward. Amen. And they don't always mean to do that. They don't always mean to 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 act in a way that's going to prevent you from moving forward, but again, it's not about what they do, it's about our response to what they do. Amen? So, last week we talked about a few things. We talked about God has left difficult people in our lives. And we, we, we went over a few things. We talked about uh, how difficult people will force us to our knees. They will force us to learn how to pray. Difficult people will expose our hidden pride. You remember that? Dealing with difficult people will also give us opportunities to show humility. Do you remember that? Amen. So I'm not going to go over all those things because we do have a lot to, to, to go over. And, and, my, and right now I'm jumping in my spirit. I mean, look calm, but I'm trying to kind of keep myself in, uh, under composure so that, so that we can get through this. Amen. Last week we ended where it says, difficult people teach us how to hear criticism without becoming defensive. Now, we didn't really explore that. We ended with that. This is where we're going to start today. Amen. Difficult people in our lives can help us to learn. I said can. That means that it's possible. Can help us to learn, teach us how to hear criticism without becoming defensive. We read over in James chapter 1. James chapter 1, verse 19 and 20. It says here in the NIV version, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and so become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. I hope you're hearing that. Be quick to hear, slow to speak. Let's talk about that for a little while. Many of us do not want to listen to what the other person has to say. And there are various reasons why we don't want to listen. Many times we will start off a conversation when we know this conversation can go a different way. We'll start off by saying, listen, I don't want you to get angry, but now, here's what we're really doing. We're trying to control the conversation before we get into the conversation. I hope you're hearing me. 
We're trying to direct the conversation before we even begin to dialogue. Amen? So what we have to do, what, we, what, what we're attempting to do, those of us who come with that that close that close uh, question or uh, come in and say, listen, I want you to, I don't want you to get mad, but what we're trying to tell them is that I have something I want you to hear, but I don't want you to respond in any way other than positive, no matter what I tell you. Well, you see, that's not really willing, being willing to willing to listen. You hear what I'm saying? You see, when we talk about listening, we're talking more than just with our ears, we're talking about with our heart. There's times when people have something they want to share with us. And we must be willing to open up and let them speak their mind, speak their heart. And sometimes we may not like what they have to say, but if it's true, we have to consider it. If it's something real, we must consider it. Many times we cannot grow because we don't want to hear the hard things. The hard things are like to keep us from being able to, watch this, respond and correct. The, the conversations that we need to have today a conversation will help us to correct bad behavior. Amen? Amen? So uh, today is, is much needed because we are on opposite, polar opposites, and many of our, on our jobs, uh, we have folk who come, come at each other because I don't agree with you. I don't agree with what you're saying. I mean, that means that I must become disagreeable. That's, that shouldn't be. Just because I don't agree with you don't mean that we should become disagreeable. That shouldn't mean that we have to come at each other and, and we, are, we, are, we want to fight and crack, scratch it and, and go at each other and cuss each other out. That should not be. But it is today. We're becoming more and more of a society that cannot dialogue with one another on a social level. We're becoming more and more uh, 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 antagonistic towards one another, combative of one another, and, and, it's, and it's time for the church, at least the church, to rise up and say, this should be a different way to do this. And the Bible gives us the answer. Amen? I'm going to ask you a question in a minute, but I want you to hang on there because I know where I'm going, all right? So hang on, we, we, we're going somewhere here. So the, the least we can do is learn how to listen, but why? Why is it so difficult for us to listen? Can I help you? Some of us are still carrying some things or conversations we had in the past. We're carrying it into a present conversation. Let me, let me explain. See, there's some folk who had conversations that hurt them in the past. And or a situation that hurt them, maybe they've been abused, or what something happened to them that caused them trauma in their life. And when they get into a certain conversation, it starts to bring up those things all over again. So now they're not just talking to the person in front of them, they're talking to the person that was there three or four years ago, maybe five or six years ago, maybe when they were a child. They're talking to that person as well. They're talking to all the individuals that have hurt them. So now they watch this, they put up a block, they put up a wall and try to defend themselves against the person who they're currently with or they're currently talking to and, and the person that's talking to them don't even understand why are, are we going through this again why are we why can't we just talk things out why is it every time we talk there's always some kind of anger or something involved here I don't know who I'm talking to right now but I'm trying to help somebody amen listen the Lord told me to tell you something that your past is just that it's not going to move. You cannot go into the past. There's no such thing as a time machine where you can go into the past, move the pieces around, rearrange them so they can work out for your favor. You cannot go back and take people out of your life that was in your life that, that hurt you and put other people in your life, go back to the past and do that. You can't do that. That's not going to happen. Your past is the past. It's stagnant. It's stuck. It's staying. It's not going to move. But here's one thing the Lord wants me to show you from the passage of Scripture over in Deuteronomy, in the chapter, first chapter. Deuteronomy, in the first chapter. I want you to see something here. All right? God said the mountain itself won't move. But because, because the mountain won't move, don't mean you have to stay where you are. Listen to me. Here it is. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 6 to 8. God will allow difficult people in your lives to help us to understand we've been in the same position for too long. You've been stuck there for too long. It's, it's past time for you to move beyond whatever it is that you carry. That's why you can't, that's why many of us can't stay in a relationship. That's why relationships are falling apart. That's why we can't, we can't even get our mind straight. That's why we can't move forward. Because we're carrying some things that God said you got to let go. Here it is. Luke, I'm mean, sorry, Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 6 to 8. 
The Lord our God said to, at, said to us at Horeb. And he's talking to the children of Israel. He's talking to the children of Israel who've been wandering in the wilderness. They've been wandering in the wilderness for approximately 30 years now. And they, they, they're supposed to be moving towards their promise now. We know they're in the wilderness because of their disobedience. They, they didn't listen to God. God told them they could go up and, 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 and take the land, the land that flows with milk and honey. Uh, was, uh, Joshua and Caleb said that we were well able, but there were 10 other spies who said we can't do it. They were, they were functioning from fear and not from faith. And the people listened to the fear rather than their faith. And so now here they are stuck in a position where they're wandering in the wilderness, but they found themselves a little spot at the foot of this mountain. And God says, watch this. He said, they found him, and he said, he told him at Horeb, you have stayed long enough. Somebody hear that. You've been there long enough at this mountain. Now look what he said. Break camp. Advance into the hill country of the Amorites. Go to all the neighboring peoples of Arabah, in the mountains, in the western hills, in the Negev, along the coast, to the land of the Canaanites, into the Lebanon, as far as the river, the great river, the river Euphrates. See, I have given you this land. Go in and take possession of the land. The Lord swore he would to give to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to their descendants after them. Let me pause for a moment. Here they are stuck at an immovable object where they weren't supposed to be anyway. They were supposed to be transient. They were supposed to be nomads. They were supposed to be wandering. They were supposed to be moving towards the promise, but they became stuck, and God says, you've been stuck there for too long. The reason why you can't get over some things, the reason why uh, relationships are falling apart, the reason why you can't get yourself together, because you're stuck in a place that won't move. The mountain itself won't move. The past won't move. But he's saying, you have to move. I hope you're hearing me. He's saying, you have to make the move. Nobody, nobody else can push you to this. God will send difficult people and difficult things into your, into your life till you finally say, why am I still putting up with this? Oh, my goodness. I'm about to mess up now. You have people who have been promising you things. You have people who say they're going to go ahead and put a ring on you. You have people who say they're going to be there for you, but they're shown in their character. They're shown they're not going to be there. They have left you hanging dry many times, and you're still sitting there hoping and praying that they will change. No, God said it's time for you to move. It's time for you to make the move. How long are you going to stay in that situation? He sent the difficulties, he sent the difficult people to help you realize you're not supposed to stay there. That's not where the promise is. The promise is beyond those people. The promise is beyond the mountain. The promise is beyond all the enemies that surrounded you. All you got to do is keep walking by faith and not by sight, and you'll enter into the blessings of God if you realize that God has a blessing waiting for you. Okay, I, I, I'm not supposed to even go to the kitchen. Y'all forgive me. Forgive me. There's something else I gotta say though. Before we move into the question I have for tonight. Alright? Uh, look at over here in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. I'm gonna try to break it down. You'll forgive me. I'm gonna get a little excited. It said in Hebrews chapter 12, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything or every weight. Hmm. Somebody said weight. Every weight and the sin that so easily beset us or easily entangles us. And let us run with, pre with, with perseverance, the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer, the author and the perfecter of our faith, the author and finisher of our faith, Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. The thing I want to point out here is this. Just like they were standing at the mountain, or they, they, they were lodging at the mountain. They set up camp at the mountain. They weren't supposed to stay. That was not, that's not where they're supposed to live. You're not supposed to take up residence in a place where God's saying, that's not yours. But he also is saying here, the race is representative of our Christian life, the Christian experience. If we're going to have victory, you've got to start casting off the weight. Just like the mountain represents your past, the weight represents the things you've been through. The weight represents the stuff you keep carrying. You can't run effectively or efficiently when you have weights that's holding you down. So, so if I can 
can give you anything. Many times you want to go on and we want to go and tweet stuff. We got hashtag this and that. Can you throw something out there? Hashtag drop the weight. Hashtag drop the weight. It's time for you to drop the weight. I'm not talking about physically. Maybe some of us, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about that spiritual weight you've been carrying. The emotional weight you've been carrying. The weight of what happened in your past. It's time for you to drop the weight. You cannot live a life of abundance. You cannot live life to the fullest while you're trying to run a race while carrying weight. It's time for you to drop it off. Amen, somebody. God's saying to you tonight that your Christian life is going to require that you discipline yourself so you can have endurance to run the race, be able to hold up under some things. That's what endurance means, to hold up under some things. You, if you, you got enough going on already. Can I make this plain? You have enough going on already. You have enough, issue, you have enough issues in your life already. You have enough problems in your life. Why are you going to keep carrying something else? Does it even make sense? Yes, they did it. Yes, they said it. Yes, it was wrong. It was terrible. It was traumatic. It was, it was, it was crazy. But you have the decision now to whether you're going to keep carrying or not. What? Listen, okay? They victimized you. You were a victim to someone else by someone else's hands. And I'm not trying to make light of this. But why are you constantly, constantly victimizing yourself? Why do you keep doing that to yourself? Because you see, allowing yourself to go ahead and keep regurgitating these thoughts. Cast off the weight. And, say, and set aside all the weight and the sin that so easily, uh, that can so easily uh, 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 trip you up that it can entangle you. The, the sin. Notice he, he, he said the weight and sin. Now we talk about that later. There's something else we can get into. But right now we're talking about you got you got to take the weight up. You got to drop the weight. Now. Because my time, I, I gotta stay within the context of my time frame here. Because you only have one more class left. But well, I need to hit you with this question. Because you see, we were talking about conversation. We were talking about talking. We were talking about being swift to hear and slow to speak. That means someone is dialoguing. And in order to dialogue, you need to hear what they're saying before you speak. But there are many times when we have to go into conversations that we really don't want. We don't really want to have to talk about certain things because they become a difficult conversation. How do I enter into a difficult conversation with someone who I know we're probably going to get upset about this, but I have to talk to them about it. I have to talk to them about their drinking. I have to talk about their gambling. I have to talk about the way they're talking to the kids, the way they treat people. I have to talk to them about their, 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 their lapse of days go away in which they approach a ministry. I have to talk to them. I have to say something. I have to say something to the co-worker who's keep working. Everybody's in there. Hey, she, don't, she, don't, she don't keep messing around. She don't keep messing around. They fired. I have to talk to the boss because he's been overlooking me and not giving me what I deserve. I've been coming in here every day on time, putting in, putting in my work, and even staying longer, putting in overtime to go and make sure. But they won't give me a race. I need to talk to this. But it's a difficult conversation because I don't know how they're going to respond. I don't know if they're going to get mad. I don't know if they're going to push me in a further situation, and I don't even know how I might respond myself. So how do you have, that's the question for tonight, how do you have a difficult conversation without losing it? I want to talk to you tonight. Talking about difficult people, you have to have difficult conversations. We live in a difficult world. So how do we have a difficult conversation without losing it? First thing I want to tell you, first thing I want to tell you is this. And I have eight, I have eight principles I want to talk about, but, but before you even get to the eight principles, I want to talk about this first. First you have to, first you have to uh, lose the attitude. Yeah. Yeah, I said that. I said that to you. I'm talking to you. Lose the attitude. You see, we come in with an attitude that's already set. I'm, I'm ready to defend myself. I'm ready to become combative. I'm ready to show them that you ain't going to run over me. Now, you haven't even gotten into the conversation yet, but you're already building up in your mind what the conversation's going to be like. So now you, you come in with an attitude already. You come in aggressive. You come in saying stuff like, you always this. You, you never do this. You, and you, you, you're giving these close-ended uh, 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 words or uh, uh, phrases that don't give them any room other than to say, well, what about what you do? That's the next thing coming out of their mind. Because you're not approaching the situation right. Coming with an attitude. Listen to what the Bible says 
about anger. Many times we come in angry because we're tired of the situation. I understand. We get tired when, when, you, when you're trying to pay the bills and every time you turn around, you're seeing more bills with credit card bills that aren't even necessary. I'm messed up now. I'm talking to somebody. Somebody about to say something. Now, hold on before you go and start getting into an argument. Amen. We, 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 before, you, before you get angry, listen to what the Bible has to say about anger. Proverbs 29 and 11. Fools give full vent to their rage, but wise, but the wise bring calm in the end. Fools just let it go. They don't care. I don't want to say what I have to say. Now I'm thinking about the consequences after you said what you had to say. Now there's consequences behind that. Now you already had problems. You came in with it to talk, want to talk about something that's difficult, but you come in angry. Now you have more, you have another problem to deal with because you say some things that you don't mean or say some things that you do mean, but you say it in the wrong way. Fools just say, I don't care. I'm just going to take what I got to say. I'm grown. Okay? Proverbs 29, I mean Proverbs 19 and 11. A, pers a person's wisdom yields patience. It is to one's glory to overlook an offense. First of all, we have to be willing, to, if we're going to get into difficult conversa conversations, we've got to be patient in the conversation. We've got to be willing to listen, take time, as you already said, and, uh, James. We've got to be take, take time to listen. Amen? That means I'm going to be patient to listen what they really have to say and ask, what are you talking about? To really get into what the person's saying, so you'll be able to go ahead and conversate on on, 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 a, on a level that says, um, "I I understand you." Even though I oh, don't fully understand, I'm trying to understand. Keep it where 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 you can you can you can be cordial, amen. So uh, um, and let me move on because he said here, it's the one's glory to overlook the offense. We're going to talk more about that in a minute. But some of us are walking around with our feelings on our sleeves, and every single thing offends us. Hmm. I'm going to let you park that there for a minute. I'm going to let you think about that. We're coming back to that. Amen? It says, Ecclesiastes 79, Do not be quickly provoked in your spirit, for anger resides in the laps of fools. I didn't say this. God did. Yes. Anger resides in the laps of fools. It's foolish for us to walk around angry all the time, always want to get revenge, always want to take it out on somebody. The Bible says vengeance is mine, save the Lord. We have to let God be the one to repay. Even though someone offends us, we can't just let it. We, we, we ought to cast some of that stuff aside. Don't, don't walk around with your feelings on your sleeve. Because if you do, everything can offend you. And then guess who's the difficult person now? Hmm. Yeah. Look at this. Last verse. Proverbs 16.32 Better a patient person than a warrior with one warrior, one with self-control than one who takes a city. I want you to look at that said in a different way over in Proverbs 25.28 Like a city whose walls are broken through is a person who lacks self-control. When we lose it, we're saying, I'm, I'm out of control. You're demonstrating that you're out of control. I don't know who this is for, but, but as I was reading, I, I thought it was going to go a different way. But somebody had to recognize that when someone does something or says something, you talk about dealing with difficult people, they, they become difficult, they say something you don't like, you do not have to respond in kind. Just because somebody cuts you out doesn't mean you have to cuss them out. Okay, I gotta, I gotta confess, I gotta say something. We were on our way here tonight to the church, the wife and I, and I'm talking about, you know, control and, you know, denying myself, and because the Bible says, you know, deny yourself daily and all this stuff. I'm trying to go ahead and keep my focus, and I'm coming off, I'm, coming, I'm, I'm getting off the, the, uh, the ramp on 255, and you know how that lane, they give you a lane to come on? Well, I'm on, I'm in my lane. Here this joke come right alongside me. Then blows on the nut just come alongside me as if I'm like, what? I looked over and there he was. I'm like, now, some words came out of my mouth. Under my breath. I'm sorry, yeah, they did. And 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 and, and, and here's the wife over there. Calm down. Calm down, it's gonna be okay. I'm looking at her like, calm down, this joke on you. You calm down. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But I, 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 I was ready to lose it. But watch this. 
If I lost control, if I decided to go behind, if I tried to start to run them over, God's to try to try to chase them down. God said, you're the one who's like a city without walls. The city walls have been broken down, meaning that no matter what, all kind of emotions come in and take you over. The spirit of the enemy can come in and take you over because you have not fortified yourself, but through prayer and through realizing there's some things you should not take on. Just let it go. Let it go. Everything should not be an argument. Everything should not be a reason to get upset. Everything should not be a reason to go ahead and just tell somebody off. Amen? So, that's for free. Now, all that, all that was free. Okay, now this, this portion of the class on cost you. Amen? Because I want to talk about eight ways to handle, eight principles to handle this difficulties. Eight principles you need to handle difficulties. First, of course, you need to do is pray. But pray for peace and progress. Pray that God will give you peace and that you be able to progress through whatever it is that you're talking about. Because you see, you should want a resolution, a solution to whatever it is you're talking about, right? Whether it be money, whether it be a relational, whatever it is. You want to talk to the person, it's difficult to talk about, but you want a resolution, you want some kind of progress. So pray, because the Bible says over Philippians 4 and 6, be not anxious, don't get stressed out about anything. But in every situation, Every circumstance, every conversation you need to have, whether it be difficult or not, he says every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, make your request be made known unto God, and the peace of God which pass all understanding shall keep your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. God can keep your mind and keep your mind in perfect peace when you decide to do it his way. So he says talk to him before you talk to that person. Talk to him before you talk, before you start getting engaged in, in conversation, particularly when you know that conversation can be a difficult one. So you need to take a step back, just like Nehemiah did. You remember over in chapter 1 of Nehemiah, we had to talk to the king about the circumstances, the situation that his people were in back when the walls were torn down, and he, he was concerned about the walls, and he showed up in the presence of the king, his face was torn up, and the king said, what is this? But sadness of heart, what, why are you, why are you cut back with your face torn up? That could have meant his life. But the Bible says, while he was standing in front of the king, he began to talk to God. He didn't go to the prayer closet. He had time to go in the corner. He started talking to God right then and there. Every now and then, when you know you're about to enter into something difficult, particularly a difficult conversation, you need to stop and pray. You don't have to go on your knees. You don't have to go find a closet. You don't have to call nobody on the phone. Just start to pray and say, God, bring peace to the situation. Put a guard over my mouth so I don't say something that's going to cause any more conflict or any more issues because I know me. Ah, there's another thing. Hold up. Know yourself before you get in there. Know yourself. Know that you have a, you have a tendency to go off the rails. So you have to pray, God, God control my mouth. God control my, my, my demeanor. Bring peace to my mind so I can speak to him. Amen? Another thing is, number two, don't assume their motivation. Don't assume why they're doing what they do. So many times I have dealt with people who have already who have decided that they know why the other person did what they did. And I'll ask the simple question, how do you know? What do you mean how do I know? I know. How do you know? I know. How, how do you? I know. How did you talk to them? Did you ask them why they didn't know? But I know why they did what they did. You don't know their motivation. I read a story about two women who got into an argument over an orange. That's right, I said an orange. Piece of fruit. They got into an argument. He had a discussion. He had, he had a conflict. And finally they said, you know, I'm so sick of you. Cut the, cut the orange in half. Give me my piece. You take your piece and get out of my face. I'm going home. So the one woman, when she got home, she ate the fruit and threw away the peel. The other woman took the peel when they used it for her for, for, for cooking and threw away the fruit. Now, if they had taken time to simply dialogue, conversate uh, in a calm way and not, and not, honest, and not trying to figure out what other, the, uh, the other person's motivation is, if they just took the time, they both would have got all that they wanted. The one person had the entire fruit, the entire orange, the other one, 
other person got the entire pill. They both were they able to use the use the items for what they wanted. But instead, they got into conflict, got into an argument, and decided they understood each other's motives without really talking to each other. That's a problem. Proverbs 20 and 5 says, The purposes of a person's heart are deep waters. No one has in but one who has insight, again, and I mean, has insight, draws them out. The, the, the Bible says that the person, uh, a per, the purposes of a person's heart are deep, but meaning that unfathomable. You have to, you have to be able to dive deep, be able to extract what's in a person's heart. Most of us, particularly men, we hide stuff in our hearts. We're not one to be more, we don't, we're not, we're not one to communicate what's going on. We don't understand how to handle feelings. Uh, that's it. All right, brothers, look, y'all just hang with me, all right? We don't know how to, we don't, if you told me how to, how to wrestle with anger, got that. Can laugh, all that, yeah, but, but when you start talking about emotional stuff, deep stuff, that's why we don't like looking at those, those chick flicks. We don't, we don't understand, Okay? Why are you going through all that? Why is she crying? Just go tell the man you love him. No, just go in and tell the man you don't want him. Just, just, just do something. Don't just stand there and just cry about it. And you want us to feel it. You don't like this movie. You don't like this movie. No, I don't like this movie. I need somebody to get shot. I need somebody to fight. I need, I need something blowed up. That's the kind of stuff I want. I want to see. But you want me to watch a movie where, it's, where you're crying and all these tears. I don't understand it. I don't understand. I don't understand. So, so instead of us, instead of, instead of us trying to watch this, judge someone else's motives, try to just understand a person. That they're, they're different. They're not. They, they, they may view the thing in a totally different way. All right. In other words, stop playing judge and jury. The Bible says over Matthew chapter seven, verse one and three: Do not judge, or you too will be judged. Oh. But in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank of wood in your own? Somebody say, Lord, have mercy. I hope this is over with soon. No. Excuse me. We need to stay here for a while. Because you see, many times we want to judge other people's motives. And every time we make a judgment call, normally it's wrong because we are not judge and jury. Only God is. Notice what, 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 what Jesus said, that whatever measure you use, I would suggest that you use mercy when you judge somebody else. I would suggest you use grace when you consider someone else's motives. Say, I don't know why they did. Maybe they have a good reason. I don't understand, but you know what? God bless them. I'm going to pray for them. I don't know what's going on. we got to talk about it and see what, is, what it really is before I make a move. I don't know anything. I don't know nothing about what they're going on. That's the kind. If you use that type of judgment, God says, I can show you some grace. I can show you because I'm going to use the same judgment you use. I'm going to use on you. i got to move. All right? He said, you got a speck of dust. Your brother has a speck of dust. Irritating. But nevertheless, it's just a small thing. Why you got a whole plank of wood in your eye? Can't see where you're going. He said, remove the plate from your eye first, and then you can help remove the speck of dust from your brothers. Amen. Instead of being judgmental and don't have and don't understand what their motive is, we should be able to help each other by being more considerate of one another. Every now and then it would be good if we can put ourselves in somebody else's place. Amen. I'm gonna move on. Number three. Number three. Deal with the problems quickly. Many times, and I have to say this for myself, we we'll sit here and let stuff fester. Right? Here we are. Here she go again. I see the bill. I see then. If I see something right now, I know we're going to have a problem. So you put it up. You walk away. A month later, another bill. Put it up. Walk away. But you didn't walk away from it, really. You carried it with you when you left the bill. The bill is still sitting on the table, but you still have it in your heart. So what happens when, when something comes up and 
She mentions, or he mentions something that you spend money on. Next thing you know, you blow up. Who you think you talking about all the money you don't spend on this? I see what you've been spending money on. You spend the money here, there, and everywhere. Ain't that looking at you? What is wrong with you? You've been carrying that. You've been carrying that anger. You've been carrying that frustration. You've been carrying. The Bible says, do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Ephesians 4 and 26. Instead of either you bring it to God immediately or you bring it to a person immediately, but don't you carry it. Don't let it fester. Because if you're going to have a conversation, as we're talking about having a difficult conversation, you must first put your own heart in check. you got to ask God, like he said in Proverbs 4 and 23, he says, God, uh, put above all things, guard your heart. Because out of it flows the issues of life. Everything emanates from your heart. And if you let something sit there long enough, before you know it, you're going to blow up at the wrong time and maybe with the wrong people. Amen, somebody. So deal with it quickly. See, most of us are used to sidestepping the difficult things. We, we used to put them on the back burner. We, we don't want to have a conversation that may bring some disruption in the house for a minute. But you need to sometimes maybe disrupt things for a minute so you can have a long-lasting peace. Once we have an understanding where the other person is coming from, then we can, we can more freely conversate without having all this, 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 this uh, uh, antagonism in the home, all this anger in the home. We can, we, can, we can have a more peaceable living arrangement because the peace of God which will be in our house because we learn to deal with things quickly. Amen. Number four, deal with the problem privately. Uh-oh. See, one of the problems we have in our culture today is that we have access to these devices that help us to, to hide through our social media. People throw shade through social media. And they want to put out their issues, their problems, the stuff they're going through. They have an issue with their husband when they put it on social media. They wonder why someone's purring around your husband. Wonder why somebody's sneaking around your back door. Because you'll put it all out on social media that you got problems. You got issues. You got stuff going on in your home. It's the, and, or you may, you may get out in a public uh, 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 place. You, you, you know, you, you, at a uh, family get together. And everybody in the family knows you're too going through something. Why? Because you're voicing it in front of everybody. Deal with your situation privately. Go somewhere behind closed doors. If there's a person who you know that you have an issue with, the Bible says if your brother or sister is, is in sin, go and point out their fault just between you and them. That's Matthew 18 and 15. Sometimes you've got to go and pull your brother aside. I've got a problem with you. We need to talk. Don't go broadcast it and tell everybody. That's one of the big problems you have, I'm sorry to say, in church. When I have a problem with one person, everybody knows who I have a problem with. Because a lot of times you're trying to get people on our side. <laughs> I'm going to save that for later. All right? We're going to go there tonight. Another thing that we need to do, number, number five, number five, tame your tongue. We talked about this. We alluded to this already. Tank, the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. How many times I heard someone say, oh, say something crazy. And they say, oh, the Lord knows my heart. Listen, God gave us a, 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 a tool to know what is really brewing in our own hearts. And the tool he gave us is our mouth. Whatever comes out of our mouth is not oops. It was in there. Amen. We didn't just trip up and, and, and tell somebody or oh, 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 spoke harsh to someone. It was in there. Amen. So we, but, so we had to learn to tame our tongues. The words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Proverbs 12, 18. The tongues of the reckless, the out of control, the ones who don't have, have understanding that, look, your words hurt, words hurt, words hurt. Saying stuff 
stuff. And even though the person may not be around, you're saying something, and somehow it gets back to them. Understand, whatever we're talking about somebody, that stuff is going to get back to them sooner or later. And you wonder why they become more standoffish, right? They want to hang around you. You try to figure out what's going on. They heard, they heard what you're talking about. Amen, somebody. I know, I know, I know. Like, come on now. Can we get to something, something else here? Well, I already told you, I told you this last week, I believe God is calling us out. I believe he's calling us to the forefront. With everything that's going on in our world today, it's absolutely imperative that you and I become what we're supposed to be. Do become what we're meant to be. We are not meant to sit in some obscure corner. The Bible says that we are supposed to be light into the world, salt into the earth. We're supposed to be like a city set on a hill. You don't take a candle, light it, and put it under the bed. You put it up on top of the dresser so the whole room can be lit. We are like the world. How can we be light and salt if we're acting like the darkness that we came out of? I'm talking about myself here. I'm talking. I don't know about you, probably could, but me, I got problems. I got issues. All right, okay. I, I, I need, I need this. I need this. And I hope somebody just put that out there. You know, put that in, 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 your, in your, in your blog. Put that in your, your tweet or whatever. Uh, or put that down. That I need this. All right. I need this. All right. He says. Um, so, so let's think back when someone hurt you, and how those words, and even now, the wounds are still there. Think about that. If someone else hurt you with words, why would we want to hurt someone else with them? Look what the Bible says over in Proverbs 15, 1 and 2. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but harsh words stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise adorns knowledge, but the mouth of fool gushes folly. In other words, watch this. A man's tongue can you pour forth help, helpful information, or a fool it's like a person who has a torrent of rain, old flooding rain. They dispute everything that's in their head and in their heart out of their mouth. Sometimes it's best to keep your mouth closed, even though you feel like telling somebody else. Just keep your mouth closed. I told you last week I'm practicing. Just locking it up. Don't say nothing. Don't say nothing. Keep it on. Keep it on the down low. I'm not saying nothing because I don't want to 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 watch this offend the person, but I also don't want to offend God. Amen, somebody. Amen, somebody. Look at this. Number six. And I told you I'm going to come back to this. Ignore, ignore petty insults. Proverbs 19, 11. I think we already read this one. We read it again. Fools show their annoyance at once, but the prudent overlook an insult. Listen to me. More than likely, when you get to the difficult conversation, somebody's going to say something. Somebody's going to say something. They either, if they don't say nothing, that body language is going to get you upset. Have you ever been in a conversation where you're talking and they're like, you know they're not listening to you or they're tired of hearing what you're saying. So now you can go ahead and get upset. So you, you, look, you, you better listen to me. You better listen to me. I got something. I'm trying to tell you something. Or they get, you know, start rolling their eyes. Their eyes everywhere. They start sucking their teeth and their head moving and everything else. Right? So you get upset. Expect that to happen. If you know that's the type of character that they have, expect it so you be prepared for it. So you don't, watch this, don't get sidetracked from what you really need to say. It's important enough for you to start the conversation. Don't let the conversation end because they, because they suck their teeth, roll their eyes. That's a lot of times our teenagers do that. Lord knows. That, Okay? Pray for me. We got teenagers, teenage grandkids that are looking at us sometimes. Amen? So, so sometimes it's, the, it's, the, it's these kids sometimes that do this. So, so you know you're going to do it. Don't you lose it because they're trying to get you to. They want you to show up. They want you to stop the conversation. But instead, you stay on point, realizing that this is what they want to do. So overlook those insults. What you have to say is too important. You have to come to some kind of resolution, some kind of solution. So you have to, you have to just overlook some of those things. Amen? Number seven, walk in forgiveness. Hmm. Walk, live in it. Have it already made up, have your mind already made up that you're going to forgive. 
See, here's one of the problems where we get insulted, we, we feel offended, we, we want to, we're carrying stuff from the past, and the reason why you're still carrying it, the reason why it's so easy, you're so easily offended, because we don't walk in a constant, a constant spirit of forgiveness. Forgiveness means I'm pardoning you. I'm letting you go. I'm not going to hold this against you. I'm not going to require anything from you. I'm not going to take anything. I don't want to extract anything from you. I don't want to take out revenge on you. I'm just going to let this go. I, it's like you never done nothing to me. Listen, I, yes, I want to I do like God. God says he takes our sins and casts them to see forgiveness. He doesn't remember them anymore. What we have to do is God, don't let this. I know what they did. But don't let them respond to them the way, the way I, sh I would if it wasn't for you. Don't let me respond to them in, in the way they treated me. Let me let that go so I can treat them the way you want me to treat them. Yeah, I know that's heavy right there. That's not easy. Sometimes forgiving some folk and the, okay, come on, on, okay, the Lord told me something right here. Forgive a person who hurt you when you were a child. Forgive a person who hurt you when you were, when you were a teenager. Forgive that, yes, even that, yeah, that person. You know what I'm talking about. Forgive that person. Not for their sake, because you're the one still in bondage. You can't even compensate with some folk because of what someone did to you, because you keep reliving it. You're still stuck at that mountain. And God said, it's time for you to let that go. Forgive them, pardon them, release them, so you can be free. Why are you still holding on and you to that past, to that pain, as we said earlier, you're not walking in forgiveness. Because, and, and watch this, you haven't been living free ever since. Galatians 5 and 1 says that for freedom Christ has come to set us free. Be not entangled again in the yoke of bondage. He came to set you free. The purpose of the cross was your freedom. The blood of Christ was to free you from sin. And, and, and Satan and, and, and eventually death God says I come to free you and yet you allow yourself to go back and stay in bondage because you won't forgive forgive and, will be free, and you will be forgiven Luke 6 and 37 to forgive essentially means to wipe the slate clean to restore the relationship back to its original state Hard as that seems, everything changes when we remain mindful of how much we have been forgiven by God. It empowers us to pay it forward. When I realize how much God has forgiven me, now I don't know about you, but I've done some things in my past. I was not right. I should, I, by rights, I should have been locked up, maybe dead. You hear what I'm saying? I'm talking real. I should not be in this pulpit standing with this mic in my hand and talking to you about the grace of God. But because of his grace and mercy, I'm here. And it's because he forgave me. So watch this. I have learned not to hold a grudge, not to hold anybody accountable to me. I have learned because I think about what Jesus did for me. That's how I get over. That's how I get past it. That's how I can let certain things go. If I had time, I could tell you some of the things I had endured, even in church. But what good would it do for me to carry a grudge and hinder me from being able to hear from my God? It's more important for me to have a relationship with God that's flourishing, that's growing, than to hold on to something that hurt me in the past. I'm trying to get off of this. Number seven, I'm not rather, number eight, the last one. Repay evil with good. <laughs> oh yeah, like wait a minute. Now, now hold up. You know, told me to forgive. That's hard enough. You told me to, to, to overlook offenses. That's hard enough. Now you tell me to repay evil when somebody's doing something wrong to me. To repay them with good. Bless on those who persecute you. Overcome them. Bless those. Bless those who persecute you. Matter of fact, look at Romans chapter. 12, verse 14. Romans chapter 12, verse 14. I want you to see that real quick. All right? Romans chapter 12, verse 14. I have it in my notes, so I'm going to have to go to it on my phone. All right? Romans chapter 12, verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Now look down at verse 21. 
Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Don't be overcome by the, by, by the treachery and, 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 and the hate that others want to spew out. Don't you allow that to overtake you. You always have a choice as to how you're going to respond. Don't ever let anybody take your choice away from you when you have the Bible to help you to be able to make a better choice. He said, don't let evil overtake you. But overtake evil, we could do something nice. I know, yeah. Oh, man, I think I just messed my own self up because the persons came into my head that I may have to treat nice who I really don't care for. Amen. But if I'm going to, listen, the Bible says God allowed the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. God allows the good to live as well as the, the bad. He allows us all to face, to feel the same sun. Amen. To eat from the same crop that he grows. God allows us to breathe the same air because of his grace. So if he can treat people who have despised him, who have hated him. Remember when he was being nailed on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He expects us to sometimes be nailed, pain, pierced in our side. Heard by the words that people, have, people say. And he says, I want you to forgive them. Don't repay evil for evil. Do something nice. Pray for them. If you can do nothing else, pray for them. Amen. Pray for your enemies. He, the Bible says we be keeping cold on their head. We be messing with their conscience because we're doing stuff that's nice even though they know they're messing with us. Amen. So I know it, 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 it's, it's what we're talking about. It's hard. But listen to me. It's called, that's why God said difficult people in your life in the first place. So we can learn to rely on God. I can't do any of this. You can't do this. You can't do what the Bible says without the Spirit of God. So that means now, once you hear what God expects, now you have to say, Lord, I can't do any of that. I'm, I'm, just, I'm telling you right now, i got a problem with everything that was said. But I want to be better. I want to live righteous. I want to be holy. Therefore, Lord, I need your help. Holy Spirit, come take the wheel. Amen. So that leads us to what we're going to talk about next week. And then we're going to, we're going to wrap it up by talking about setting boundaries. Uh, Y'all right, don't miss that. Don't miss that. All right? We're going to talk about setting boundaries. But I want you to see something. Jesus dealt with difficult people. Matter of fact, God dealt with difficult people. So how should we respond to difficult people? Jesus is our example. First of all, uh, Jesus used rebuke. He rebuked some people when it was necessary. John 8 and 47. Anyone who belongs to God, listen gladly to the words of God. But you don't listen because you don't belong to God. He had to get with the Pharisees and the scribes because they were talking as if they were part of God's family. And he had to tell them, no, you're not. He had to rebuke them. He also, he dealt with difficult people and, and that he, sometimes he just remained silent. Remember when they brought the woman who was caught in adultery? Imagine, they brought the woman, but was man, we no, you give it to that baby. Brought the woman, caught in adultery, and Jesus, when he said, look, this woman's caught in adultery, Moses said, we are stoned. What do you say? Trying to trip him up. Jesus was cool. He just didn't say nothing. He started writing in the dirt. We don't know what he wrote in the dirt. But when he got up, when he got up off his knee from writing in the dirt, he looked and he said, now which one? He said, what? the first one, the one without sin. Yeah. The one without sin. Cast the first stone. From the oldest to the youngest, they dropped their stones. Why? Because they realized, I ain't right either. Jesus didn't have to get into a discourse. He didn't got to have to get into an argument. One thing about Jesus is that when he dealt with difficult people, he never changed his character. That's what he want for us. He didn't change who he was because people didn't act right, didn't like him, they talked about him, and even, stalked, well, even, even uh, 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 persecuted him and, and ripped his beard from his face and put nails in his hands and feet. He never changed who he was, nor did he ever lose focus on his purpose. Don't lose focus on your purpose. Because that's what any would love for you to do. Not only did Jesus lose silence, not only did he rebuke when it was necessary, but Jesus also asked questions. He said in Mark 11, 28, 29, 
They demanded, by what authority have you doing these things? The scribes and the Pharisees. Who gave you the right to do this? Jesus said, I tell you by my authority, by what authority I do these things. If you ask the one question, was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? With the ministry that John had, was it from heaven or from man? And they said, well, if we say it was from man, the people thought he was a great man, and the, we, the people get mad with us, and we say it was from heaven, and they said, well, why didn't we obey God? So I'm paraphrasing. So, so basically what he did, he shut them down by asking one question. He said, since you can't tell me, he said, we don't know. Since you can't tell me, I'm not going to tell you about how, how I got my authority going about your business. Sometimes you don't have to get into anything heavy. And he said, well, you tell me. What makes you think you can question me when you don't even know who you are and why you do what you do and you want to question me? Hmm. Jesus pointed them to the scriptures. Mark 10, 2 to 3. He pointed them to the scriptures. You'll read that when you get a chance because my time is running up. Jesus confronted them by telling the story. Luke 7, 36 and 42. Where the woman who washed his feet with her hair. He confronted them by telling the story. But Jesus saved the sternest rebuke for the religious leaders. Over in Matthew 23. I wish I had time to go there. But Jesus held his most sternest, the harshest words he said to anyone was in Matthew 23 to the religious leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees. He said, look, these men sit in Moses' seat. So do what they say, but not what they do. Because you see, they have a tendency to do things that were contrary to the word that they're supposed to know. They didn't do what God said. Do they did what they wanted to do, but they stood, but they, they had their, their robes on, they had their religious their, their, or their religious articles and everything else on. They had their, their hats, their faculties, they had the they had the Bible, notes of the of the word of God are wrapped up in, in, in their sleeve. And they walked around want, want to be called rabbi. They want to be uh, 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 they want to be honored in the streets and they want to sit in the highest seats. But yet, when it came to helping somebody, they couldn't help one person. He said, you go get across mountain, river, and, and valley to, to, to turn one person into a proselyte, to turn them into one of you. But when trouble hits, you won't take your finger, one thing to help them out. You're stopping them. You're not going to heaven yourself, and you're stopping them from going to heaven. Jesus said, you're like, why did sepulchers, great dead men, tombs, and all this in you is nothing but death? He held his harshest word. What am I saying? Sometimes you got to get with people. But understand, you got to know beyond certainty that this person, and notice what Jesus did. Jesus didn't do this for himself. He did this in defense of others. Jesus didn't rebuke them because he felt offended. He did this because they were offending others. So I got to go. I got to go. I got to go. My time is up. I hope you got something out of this. Be with me next week. Last class, we're going to talk about setting up boundaries. Boundaries will help you. Boundaries will help you. I'm going to talk, we're going to, that's all we're going to talk about next week is setting up boundaries. Amen? So, God bless you. Pray for us. We're praying for you. We love you. We thank you. I hope you got something out of this. Again, hit that like button. Go ahead and share it. Share all the stuff that we're trying to do. We really mean to impact our community with the word of God. So God bless you. We love you and good night. Amen.